So what I'm trying to do now is to record both on video and on audio so I can put this, upload this as a podcast and also as a video on YouTube hopefully. We'll see how it goes. It's the first time. So I'm sorry if the microphone gets in the way. But um, so what I wanted to talk about today, I haven't been talking to you a lot recently, is about the role specifically of science in uh, supporting people. So what role should science have in mental health services, if we want to call them this way? Now, the odd thing is that this is a question that is not asked very often and debates on social media seems seem to be around whether approaches that we discuss are evidence-based or not. So evidence-based approaches are good, non-evidence-based approaches are bad. And it's basically, this is the, the working assumption on, um, on building a system or changing the system. So I don't think that that is a, an assumption that uh, is so straightforward. I wanted to talk about an author, a philosopher, uh, Paul Feyerabend. Now this is the, the Italian version of one of his uh, most, well probably his most important work, Against Method. Uh, I think he's, it's, he's a fascinating philosopher that questioned the dominant uh, philosophy of, of science, that of Karl Popper. And briefly, I'm not an expert in philosophy, but I did study, this is one of the few um, philosophy exams, <clears throat> the, uh, philosophy, on science, philosophy of science exams that I did during my psychology years at university. And I just wanted to go through briefly uh, what uh, Farabin had to say, as opposed to Popper, to, to Popper to see how this affects the way we should build or shouldn't build a system system basically so what popper said what what popper remained famous to, uh, for mainly is the falsification principle so if you want to to make a, an example a practical example if you want to prove that there are no black swans which was a rather relevant example at the time uh, you know in the past if you want to prove that there are no black swans in the world, it doesn't matter how many white swans you find, because all you need is to find one black swan that would disconfirm your idea that there are only white swans. So what you should be doing is not looking for as many white swans as you can, but you should be looking for a black swan. I think that in this particular case, the issue was uh, black swans are were native to Australia, so. You, it was a common belief that swans were always white until people went to Australia and so oops you know there are actually black swans so that that just confirms the idea that all swans are white so the idea was you know when you want to prove if your theory is right you try to find uh, data that would falsify your um, theory and you need to put your theory to the test uh, of, of falsification and if uh, the, your theory your theory cannot be falsified you, you put it to the test and it survives that test and actually you know there are no black swans uh, then uh, you know your theory stands up and it, it's it's a step that makes it uh, a more um, solid theory from a scientific perspective let's say uh, whereas if you're always seeking confirmation of your ideas, all, you can find all the white swans in the world that build a very persuasive uh, perception that there's only white swans and that's kind of a pseudo-scientific idea because actually it's not, you're not falsifying it. Um, so I've, I've, I can think of a lot of, so this system, the mental health system in Britain, insists a lot of ev on evidence-based. And really, I think that a lot of its ideas are not falsifiable, like, for example, the idea that psychiatric hospitals are places of safety. Because when something goes wrong after a person's being in a psychiatric hospital, or when a person is in a psychiatric hospital, still, they're places of safety. It's just that they needed to be more coercive and everything would have been safe. So, you know, there's no mechanism really there. But I'm not trying to talk about this, because I think this is the trap in which 
we fall. So a lot of critics of the system um, are trying to, to shift the system from one uh, scientific approach. Um, for example, there's a lot of rhetoric now from the drop the disorder movement um, to move towards, say, to, to adopt a Kuhnian revolution. So Kuhn, uh, in short, again, thought that at a certain point, a paradigmatic shift based on certain themes, certain ideas, uh, in the history, you know, sometimes, you know, par there's paradigms that are inadequate and at a certain point they, they get abandoned because the evidence just doesn't support them. And then there's a new paradigm. So you, they've dropped the disorder roughly, I think, uh, wants to move from a medical understanding to a psychosocial understanding of suffering. Now, that is still a scientific understanding of suffering. So you'll say, well, what is the problem? with a scientific understanding of suffering. So Farab, and here's where he comes in to the picture. I mean, I was very persuaded uh, before getting, so I'm jumping to, from subject to subject, but hopefully you'll be able to understand what I'm saying. Uh, I was very, so before Farab, and sorry, I was very persuaded by studying, you know, what Popper had to say, looking at how experimental psychology worked, especially social psychology, was absolutely fascinated by social psychology and I thought that that was the way to go, that that was, you know, with science you could find objective truths and it wasn't just my idea versus your idea. We could, if I disagreed with you, we could do an experiment and find out who's right and we could build this objective, you know, true system, uh, true, true everything, true society, you know, everything. Um, would be scientific and therefore objective and a lot of people and I think on many sides of all, on all sides mainstream sides of the argument seem to roughly ag agree on this amazingly and here's where Farab and comes in so I did this the first uh, this like say course I did at University of Science was centered on Popper mainly. It was about philosophy of science. The second course that I did, second exam on philosophy of science, was centered about Feyerabend, and he just changed my view on science completely. So Feyerabend was a physicist originally. He studied physics, and then by some bizarre twist of destiny, he was offered to become a professor of philosophy to teach philosophy of science and he said okay well I can do that but I don't know anything about philosophy of science so he went to lectures he tried to get informed and tried to learn and he learned about this dominant view that you know falsification pauper etc and he was listening and he didn't agree with any of this <laughs> and uh, it's interesting why I didn't agree with any of this I mean didn't agree with any of this he didn't think that this was how knowledge and how uh, in in society developed throughout the years. So he didn't think that it only came through um, the scientific method. He didn't think that it uh, always came through trying to falsify hypotheses. And he actually went further than that. He said, "Well, actually, sometimes development happens." in open contrast to the falsification principle. And he makes an example, not a, it means a range of examples in this book, Against Method, um, to support his view. Uh, his view wasn't against science. He was the idea that science is one of the methods with which society can improve. He had nothing against it. But he said there are other methods and indeed, sometimes these other methods clash with what science would say. And sometimes these other methods then prove that these other approaches based on intuition are considered to, to get a better picture of the truth with time. And so that from this comes the idea that is often misunderstood that anything goes in terms of a method to get to development. So um, this book against method was supposed to be a book in two parts. 
Uh, I think he had an ongoing debate with the scientist. I think his name was Imre Lakatos, and the book, the they were they discussed, they had this continuous debate, and they said, you know what? Why don't we write a book? And it, the book I think was supposed to be called For Method and Against Method, and Lakatos was supposed to write a part of the book strongly in favor of scientific, you know, the scientific method, evidence based approach, and. Farah Rabin was supposed to write the part against method and uh, I think Lakatos died before this could, you know, this project could develop and so Far Rabin in the end decided to publish his own part, just his own part, against method and it was written in, Lakatos has specifically instructed him to rock, write it in a very provocative way so saying things that are absolutely exaggerated but just to try and make his points as in you know, the most radical clear way possible so one of the examples there are many some of them I don't even understand because I don't study physics so it comes to rather complex uh, examples as well but one of the ones that is very clear uh, he goes right to the heart of, of science and he brings the example of Galileo Galilei Galilei was, is one of the symbols of, of, of the development of science, one of the symbols of a scientist that fought against the Roman Catholic Church, uh, who was, you know, more in favour of the Holy Bible and that version of uh, the relation between the sun and the earth, uh, geocentric versus heliocentric uh, structure, uh, you know, of the, <laughs> of the relations between uh, celestial bodies uh, and he he said well let's look at what Galilei was saying and let's look at what the objections to what Galilei uh, was saying were at the time and so he says one of the objections one of the st really strong objections to Galilei at the time was the following more or less so people were saying at the time if you go on a tower and from that tower you throw a stone. If it's true, as Galilei was claiming, and Copernicus as well, that the Earth turns on itself uh, at very high speeds, then what should happen is that the stone would not, would not fall, at, fall, uh, fall at the bottom of the tower, but would fall many, many kilometers away. Now, obviously, nowadays, uh, I'm not a physicist, so you can ask a physicist to explain why that argument is silly. Um, but uh, for, uh, but at the time, that was perfectly a perfectly valid point to make. Not only really a perfectly valid point to make, but a point that was perfectly in line with the principles that late the principle of false falsification that let later Popper would have say at, at uh, uh, brought forward. So you try to falsify this theory, you say, well, look, if your theory is true, the stone will fall many kilometers from the bottom of the tower, from the base of the tower. If your theory is wrong, if the earth, in fact, doesn't turn on itself, then the stone will fall exactly at the base of the tower. And Ga Galilei's answer to this was, well, you know, you're seeing this, you're seeing this without enough critical understanding so for example he says if you walk if you walk on the street and you look at the moon and there's a full moon you might get the impression as you walk that the moon is following you you know you go you go along and the moon is always you know going wherever you're going and obviously that's not true obviously the moon is not moving following you but you get this illusion and so Galilei says you are interpreting an illusion what he thought was an illusion uh, as as a fact and how do we know that it's a you know that it's not an illusion and the arguments that Galilei is bringing forward are not scientific at all they're based on an, on an argumentation based on his intuitions based on a range of factors that included scientific factors but he was challenging an argument based specifically on the principles of falsification with other points that had nothing to do with the principle of falsification and in the end obviously 
Galilei was proven right. In the end, now we know that the Earth turns on itself. So, why am I saying all of this? Because when they talk about evidence-based practice in mental health services, this concept has a range of flaws, uh, which the system currently prevents us from discussing. You cannot question a scientific concept. Uh, and it, this is based on the flawed understanding that when everything, when something is scientific, then it's automatically a good thing. And when something is not scientific, it's automatically a bad thing. And one of the many consequences of saying that you can only do something that is evidence-based is that, uh, more very, very simply, you can't really try anything new. Because obviously anything new won't have an evidence base. You need to get an evidence base, you need to try something new. So it's an intrinsically conservative principle. Uh, it's not only really intrinsically conservative, but intrinsically institutional. So what evidence base means is, let's say, evidence base for catatonia, uh, evidence base for severe schizophrenia, you know, uh, these constructs that we build and uh, we try to address as constructs what if you if you're asking me what is the answer to that uh and you're framing the problem in that in those terms you're asking me for a one size fits all answer that fits people that have that presentation as if they were all more or less the same and change the presentation now the presentation the label catatonia which is not a diagnosis, but the label schizophrenia, the label uh, depression. These are descriptive accounts of what's happening. They don't tell you anything of what the person is going through. Um, like very low mood. It doesn't tell you anything about what's going on. You know, you can get some heroin, maybe you feel better. But, you know, that to say that that's a success, that doesn't capture anything of what's going on. So the... the the demand of evidence-based practice is to bring forward um, an, a solution that objectifies the situation, that is a response to a presentation that is descriptive, not a response to the needs of a person. Um, but you see, if I say, if I say, well, I want, I would like to respond to the needs of the person, they'll say, well, that's not scientific because your subjective. Uh, your subjective um, response to the needs of the person cannot be objectified to be the response that we give to a group of people that we throw in a basket as if they were all the same. And so, you know, the problem is that science alone can't bring us to a system that is that values subjectivities, that is person-centred can only bring us to a, a system that is objectifying and in a way dehumanizing that doesn't take into account not only of the subjectivity of the person who suffers but of the person who's trying to help and doesn't create that space now this doesn't mean that then oh well there's no way to measure success uh, because you could put in, in bring into the system other ways of seeing things that are more based on creating a setting that favours subjectivity and you could see that in the end this approach has a success or not, or not. and that's why I'm so, always, uh, you know, I always bring up Trieste not because I like so much talking about Trieste really because I prefer, as I did now, I prefer talking about my ideas but uh, Trieste is a perfect example of how an approach not based on evidence-based practice, it wasn't built on research, it was based on a trial and error approach by Vasalia and others. How that approach, uh, which doesn't use ECT, doesn't use locked doors, doesn't use restraint, we can see how that in the end bring, brought about a reduction in the suicide level, for example. So you, you can see, you can use science then to build an argument for that approach, but in itself, uh, in itself, uh, the Trieste model, the Basalian idea, was uh, to a significant extent an anti-scientific endeavour. Not anti-scientific in the sense that it rejected science, but in the sense that it rejected science as the only way uh, 
to build a system. It was uh, probably an approach that was, even though I don't know if Feyerabend had any contact with Basaglia, but uh, probably not actually. The book Ariel's Method was in 1975 when Basaglia had almost completed his work. But uh, I mean, it was, the hospital chest was closed in 1980. So, uh, we need, we need to try, if we want to move forward in this system, this idea of a Kuhnian revolution moving from one scientific paradigm to another scientific paradigm doesn't, will never bring us to subjectivity. So it, it, we need a revolution, unfortunately. I know it's the most difficult thing to do, to question the premises of an entire system. But this is what we need to do. We need a revolution in this system. And um, I think that we need to stop making these falling in the trap when people say well what's the evidence for this what's the evidence for that to try and find other objectifying alternatives to the objectifying options of the system because we don't want another objectifying alternative we need to explain what the problem is with that approach and explain what the alternative is and on this note that's it for now thank you bye bye